What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. In the previous video of this series, we stressed on the importance of modeling our domain and mentioned that creating the model alongside domain experts by using a ubiquitous language will ease the coding process, leading to an overall model-driven design of the code. So as promised, let's go ahead and look at the main building blocks of a model-driven design. The diagram you see presents some of the key elements of object modeling and software design from the viewpoint of domain-driven design. Let's dive into each one of these elements separately. A layered architecture. When we create a software application, a large part of the application is not directly related to the domain, but is part of the infrastructure or serves the software itself. Therefore, we need to develop a layered design, where the elements of each layer are cohesive and where the layer depends only on the ones below it. We'll have to concentrate all the code related to the domain model in one layer and isolate it from the user interface, the application, and the infrastructure code. This allows the model to evolve, to be rich and clear enough to capture essential business knowledge and put it to work. A common architectural solution for domain-driven designs, which we already discussed in our very first DDD video, contains four conceptual layers. The user interface or presentation layer, this layer is responsible for presenting information to the user and interpreting user commands. The application layer coordinates the application activity. It does not contain business logic. It does not hold the state of the business object, but it can hold the state of an application task progress. The domain layer, which contains information about the domain. This is the heart of the business software. The state of business objects is held here. And the infrastructure layer, which acts as a supporting library for all the other layers. It provides communication between layers, implements persistence for business objects, contains supporting libraries for the user interface layer, etc. Next, entities. In every business domain, there is a category of objects which seem to have an identity, which remains the same throughout the states of the software. For these objects, it is not the attributes that matter, but a thread of continuity and identity which spans the life of a system and can extend beyond it. Such objects are called entities. If we were to implement the concept of a person using a software program, we would probably create a person class with a series of attributes, name, date of birth, place of birth, etc. Are any of those attributes the identity of the person? Name cannot be the identity as we can have many people holding the same name. Same goes for the others. Mistaken identity can lead to data corruption. However, if we were to consider a bank account, each account has its own number. An account can be precisely identified by its number. This number remains unchanged throughout the life of the system and assures continuity. So implementing entities and software means creating identity. For a person, it can be a combination of attributes. For a bank account, the account number seems to be enough. When an object is distinguished by its identity rather than its attributes, you must represent this in its definition in the model. Keep the class definition simple and focused on lifecycle continuity and identity. Entities are important objects of a domain model and they should be considered from the beginning of the modeling process. Okay, let's jump to value objects and consider a drawing application where the user is presented with a canvas and he can draw any number of points on it. This will be later used to create an object out of the class named point. The point object would contain two attributes associated with the coordinates. Is it necessary to consider each point as having an identity? Does it have continuity? It seems that the only thing that matters for such an object is its coordinates. We are not interested in which object it is, but what attributes it has. Objects that are used to describe certain aspects of a domain and do not have identity are named value objects. It is necessary to distinguish between entity objects and value objects. It is not helpful to turn all objects into entities for the sake of uniformity. This will simplify the design and have some other positive consequences, as by having no identity, value objects can be easily created and discarded. It is highly recommended that value objects be immutable. They are created with a constructor and never modified during their lifetime. They should be kept thin and simple. Next, we have services. When we analyze the domain and try to define the main objects that make up the model, we discover that some aspects of the domain are not easily mapped to objects. For example, transferring money from one account to another. Should that function be in the sending account or the receiving account? It feels just as misplaced in either. When such a behavior is recognized in the domain, the best practice is to declare it as a service. Such an object does not have an internal state and its purpose is to simply provide functionality for the domain. A service should not replace the operation which normally belongs on domain objects. We should not create a service for every operation needed. 
There are three characteristics of a service. One, the operation performed by the service refers to a domain concept which does not naturally belong to an entity or value object. Two, the operation performed refers to other objects in the domain. And three, the operation is stateless. While using services, it is important to keep the domain layer isolated. It is easy to get confused between services which belong to the domain layer and those belonging to the infrastructure. Both application and domain services are usually built on top of domain entities and values providing required functionality directly related to those objects. Deciding which layer a service belongs to is difficult. If the operation performed conceptually belongs to the application layer, then the service should be placed there. But if the operation is about domain objects and is strictly related to the domain serving a domain need, then it should belong to the domain layer. Okay, let's talk about modules. For a large and complex application, the model tends to grow bigger and bigger. The model reaches a point where it is hard to talk about and understand the relationships and intersections between its different parts. For that reason, it is necessary to organize the model into modules. Modules are used as a method of organizing related concepts and tasks to reduce complexity. Another reason for using modules is related to code quality. It is widely accepted that software code should have a high level of cohesion and a low level of coupling. While cohesion starts at the class and method level, it can be applied at module level. It is recommended to group highly related classes into modules to provide maximum cohesion possible. Using modules while designing is a way to increase cohesion and decrease coupling. Modules should be made up of elements which functionality or logically belong together. Modules should have well-defined interfaces which are accessed by other modules. Instead of calling three objects of a module, it is better to access one interface because it reduces coupling. Low coupling reduces complexity and increases maintainability. It is easier to understand how a system works when there are few connections between modules which perform well-defined tasks than when every module has lots of connections to all the other modules. Okay, after going through the main building blocks of model design, let's talk a bit about aggregates, factories, and repositories. Domain objects go through a set of states during their lifetime. They are created, placed in memory, used in computations, and are destroyed. In some cases, they are saved in permanent locations, like a database, or they can be archived. And at some point, they can be completely erased from the system. Managing the life cycle of a domain object constitutes a challenge, and if it is not done properly, it may have a negative impact on the domain model. Therefore, aggregates are used to define object ownership and boundaries, whereas factories and repositories help us deal with object creation and storage. Okay, let's start talking about aggregates. A model can contain many domain objects. No matter how much consideration we put in the design, it happens that many objects are associated with one another, creating a complex net of relationships. The challenges of models are most often not to make them complete enough, but rather to make them as simple and understandable as possible. It is difficult to guarantee the consistency of changes to objects in a model with complex associations. To solve this, we can use aggregates. An aggregate is a group of associated objects which are considered as one unit regarding data changes. The aggregate is delimited by a boundary which separates the objects inside from those outside. Each aggregate has one root. The root is an entity and it is the only object accessible from outside. The root can hold references to any of the aggregate objects and the other objects can hold references to each other. But an outside object can hold references only to the root object. If there are other entities inside the boundary, the identity of these entities is local, making sense only inside the aggregate. But how is the aggregate ensuring data integrity and enforcing the invariance? Well, since other objects can hold references only to the root, it means that they cannot directly change other objects in the aggregate. All they can do is change the root or ask the root to perform some actions, and the root will be able to change the other objects, but that is an operation contained inside the aggregate and is controllable. If objects of an aggregate are stored in a database, only the root should be obtainable through queries. The other objects should be obtained through traversal associations. In a nutshell, what you need to do is cluster the entities and value objects into aggregates and define boundaries around each. Then choose one entity to be the root of each aggregate and control all access to the objects inside the boundary through the root. And finally, allow external objects to hold references to the root only. A simple example of an aggregation is shown in the following diagram. The customer is the root of the aggregate and all the other objects are internal. If, for example, the address is needed, a copy of it can be passed to external objects and can be only accessed via a customer. Entities and aggregates can often be large and complex, too complex to create in the constructor of the root entity. 
Therefore, a new concept is necessary to be introduced, one that helps to encapsulate the process of complex object creation. This concept is called a factory. Factories are used to encapsulate the knowledge necessary for object creation, and they are especially useful to create aggregates. When the root of the aggregate is created, all the objects contained by the aggregate are created along with it, and all the invariants are enforced. It is important for the creation process to be atomic. If it is not, there is a chance for the creation process to be half done for some objects, leaving them in an undefined state. There are times when a factory is not needed, and a simple constructor is enough. So, when should we favor a constructor over a factory? Well, if the construction is not complicated, if the creation of an object does not involve the creation of others, and all the attributes needed are passed via the constructor. If the client is interested in the implementation, perhaps wants to choose the strategy used, or if the class is the type, meaning there is no hierarchy involved, so no need to choose between a list of concrete implementations. In a model-driven design, objects have a life cycle starting with creation and ending with deletion or archiving. A constructor or a factory takes care of object creation. The entire purpose of creating objects is to use them. In an object-oriented language, one must hold a reference to an object to be able to use it. Using an object means the object has already been created, and one way to access that created object is connect to a database, retrieve the object from it, and use it. Databases are part of the infrastructure, and a poor solution is for the client to be aware of the details needed to access a database. However, having easy access to the database quickly swamps client code, leading developers to dumb down the domain layer, making the model irrelevant. And the overall effect is that the domain focus is lost and the design is compromised. To solve this, use repositories. Its purpose is to encapsulate all the logic needed to obtain object references. When an object is created, it may be saved in the repository and retrieved from there to be used later. If the client requested an object from the repository and the repository does not have it, it may get it from the storage. Either way, the repository should act as a storage place for globally accessible objects. A repository may contain detailed information used to access the infrastructure, but its interface should be simple. A repository should have a set of methods used to retrieve objects. The factory should create new objects, while the repository should find already created objects. When a new object is to be added to the repository, it should be created first using the factory, and then it should be given to the repository, which will store it. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like more videos about this topic, where we dive even further in domain and model-driven designs. So, that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching. Take care, and I will see you in the next one.